Praise the Lord. It's good to be here today with you. See a lot of people that I've had a lot of interaction with over the years, and uh, it's exciting to be able to come back home, I guess you would say. This was my home church growing up, and a lot of fond memories at a couple different church locations that I remember, and uh, finally settling in here, and I'm excited to be here today with you. Uh, my wife is around here somewhere. Our, our, oh, there she is in the back. She has our baby, which I think is finally falling asleep, so uh, she can stay in for a few minutes until she wakes up. But uh, I'm thankful for my wife, Laura, and we have a seven-year-old, uh, Jada, who I believe is downstairs in kids' ministry. She loves Pastor Amber. And um, we have our baby, Lennox, and she's our miracle child as a caller. She will be one years old in two days. She is a New Year's baby. Yeah, praise the Lord. I'm thankful. And God is faithful. Um, so we have a lot of ties here. We, I was um, set forth by Pastor Atkins uh, as, a, as a young man, before I, right before I went off into college, or maybe even my first years of college. And uh, from there, I, I graduated from Liberty. And uh, my last year <clears throat> at Liberty, I was praying and knew I was called in the ministry, didn't know really what God wanted to do with my life, but I knew I was called. When he called me, he said, Jerry, and it was as clear as day, he said, Jeremy, you're going to preach and you're going to play music. And that's what your calling is going to be. And I had no clue what that would look like. Um, but uh, I knew that's what God had put in my life. And we were at uh, Camp Loman and we were in a church service. And I just remember the spirit coming upon us so strong and just got on my face before the Lord. And uh, I knew God had called me into that. And I was like, God, all right, I'll go anywhere. Be careful when you pray this prayer. <laughs> I said, God, I'll go anywhere and do anything. As long as I know your hands on it, and that's what you have for me. And uh, I had kind of had my life mapped out about what I wanted to do. And uh, I got a phone call from a pastor in Virginia Beach, and he said, Jeremy, God has put it in my heart that you're going to be the youth pastor here at my church. And I was like, uh, I don't know about that. Uh, it's not part of my plan that I have. And uh, so I, I prayed about it, and I called him back, and I said, I just don't think that that's what God has for me right now. He said, well, how about this? You just continue to pray about it, and we'll see what God does. Not the answer I was expecting, but I was like, all right, fair enough. And uh, again, I was at Camp Loman in a service, and it, I, I, sometimes I just feel and hear God in my spirit so clearly, and that was one of them. And he said, Jeremy, you're supposed to go to Virginia Beach and be the youth pastor there. And uh, I said, all right, Lord. So I called him back that night, and I said, well, I'm coming. He said, I know. I said, I told you you were going to be here. So uh, the Lord knew, <laughs> knew that I was going to be there. And so we went to Virginia Beach, and, and I went there as a youth pastor. And um, uh, while we were down there, some things happened. And I actually, uh, Laura and I at that time had gotten engaged, and uh, we uh, church planted. So I don't know if you've ever church planted before, been a part of a church plant. It is an experience, and uh, I loved it. It was great. We planted a church there and got a church up and running in a church building that wasn't currently being used, and it was a, it was a great experience for us. And uh, from there, God actually brought us back here, and we worked under David Brown um, here in the youth ministries for a while. And we were here for about a year, and I got a phone call uh, from a pastor in Virginia Beach who my name was suggested to for a youth ministry opening. And uh, so I talked to him, and Laura and I went down and visited the church, and when we went there that Sunday, it was just an overwhelming, in both of our spirits, like, we're supposed to be here. Um, it's tough when you have to up and leave your family and your friends and everything and move, but when God says go, you go. And uh, so we went to uh, North Carolina, and we were youth pastors there for a while, and God was good to us, and... Um, made our way eventually back up here through some things and became young adult pastors. We did some traveling evangelism and some things like that. And then we became young adult pastors at a church and uh, we loved it there. And uh, God was blessing our ministry and we had actually became part-time on staff there. And uh, they moved us up from just young adult pastors to campus pastors. And uh, pretty much with the understanding that you're going to be full-time within a year, which I don't know if you ever know a minister, your like ultimate dream is to be in full-time ministry. And that's just me. I know people are like, yeah, right. No, no, for me, it was like, that's all I've ever wanted to do would be in full-time ministry. And, and so I was like, this is awesome. This is finally going on the plan that I have set for myself a long time ago. It's all working out now. And then you get a phone call and, uh, 
that phone call said, hey, uh, Jeremy, we have an opening for our state youth position, and I want you to pray about that opening and come talk to uh, Bishop Shaw. And, and I said, okay. So I prayed about it, and we, uh, Laura and I talked about it, and we just felt like for this season, this is what we're supposed to be doing. And so we accepted the state youth position, and we've been working there since last September. So we've been about a year and a couple of months, and, and God has been good to us and faithful to us. And um, recently, within the past two or three weeks, we were actually, um, the person who was the camp coordinator um, just stepped down. Uh, she just has a lot going on with the new job that she's taking everything, so she wasn't able to to do this job anymore and uh, do the camp coordinator job. So we've actually added that title to what we're doing, too. So we are the camp coordinators, and we're operating, helping with all the camps at Camp Loman, um, which is the um, camping ministry for the Church of God Prophecy here in Virginia. And then we're also doing the state youth work. So uh, I would love to tell you that I've achieved my my goal of being in full-time ministry, but that has not happened yet. I still teach. Uh, I teach middle school PE and health, and I love my job. It's a great job, and I get to get a lot of um, experience working with young people in the middle school level. Now, I don't know if you've ever worked with middle school kids, but wow, <laughs> they are a handful. Um, and I, I always interweave stories about what happens in my working with kids into um, uh, my my preaching and, and everything because it's very real. And I, I really feel like in my ministry, my main thing that I want to do is I want to be real. And I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to be real with you. And I feel like when we're real with each other and you guys know that I don't have myself all together. I still have struggles. I actually talked with Ashley um, Lucas. I always called her Boyd, sorry. Lucas this morning. And uh, we were talking, and uh, I just posted something on Facebook the other day. It's like, man, I'm struggling with this. And it's okay to have struggles. It's okay to have to to have feelings and, and sometimes feel certain ways or think certain things. And those things are okay. Um, I doubt sometimes, man. I, sometimes I question, like, is this this or is this is this that? And God has to really work on me and, and deal with me. So I believe in being real, and I hope that comes out um, in in the message today. If you can go ahead and start turning to Acts chapter twenty. My buddy Adam Baird, he he uh, lived here for a while, and uh, at the church we were at, he actually preached this message, and it just touched my heart so much. And um, I think it was actually close to the Maybe not. Maybe I have my time frame off, but I think it was pretty close to the time where we uh, we were still serving as young adult pastors, but we kind of knew that we were going to take the other role. So it just touched my heart about youth ministry, and I really want to focus on our young people today and the, and what God has for them. So as you're turning to Acts chapter 20, uh, there's a few things that are true today that were not true in the 80s and 90s when I grew up. I was born in 1984, and uh, my mom is here, and my dad, I think, is somewhere around here doing security. So I was born in 1984, so I grew up in the 80s and 90s, and there's some things that were true in the 80s and 90s when I was growing up that was not true, or that's not true today with the kids that I work with and even raising my own children. The first one here is when it comes to hair, the bigger, the better. That might not be true today. Some of you may have had this hairdo uh, when, <laughs> when you were growing up. Uh, I remember one time we were, we were at Easter. My, my grandfather was a pastor, so we didn't get much, many Easters with him because he was always in church preaching Easter. And uh, for whatever reason, they were in. And I had my grandfather and my grandmother in, and my grandma had a big beehive. This is my grandma Baldwin, and she had a big beehive, and we were hiding Easter eggs, right? And you can see where the story's going. And so there, we, we started doing the hot and cold game because I could not find the last Easter egg. And sur sure enough, they had taken that Easter egg, and they had put it in my grandma's beehive. I don't know if y'all remember that, but... Um, but, but yeah, so when, when we had hair back in the 80s and 90s, the bigger, the better. Maybe not so true today. Number two, wrestling was real. Look, I was a big wrestling fan back in the day, man. I used to never miss a Monday night. I watched it all the time, and uh, it was real back in the day. Maybe not so much today as I've gotten older. Number three, Michael Jordan was the best basketball player of all time. You can debate this all you want, but to me, Michael Jordan is the GOAT. That means the greatest of all time. I learned that. Uh, the greatest of all time, right? He, LeBron is great. Kobe's great, but none of them can touch Jordan. I'm sorry. He was the best. 
Number four, being able to sit in the front seat was a privilege. I don't know if y'all remember doing this, especially if you had a sibling or somebody that rode with you all the time, but you would like wait, and as soon as you got the door, you'd be like, shotgun, right? Because you wanted to get in and get the front seat. Y'all anybody remember doing that? You called shotgun so you could sit in the front. Yeah. Now it's like, oh, I'm sitting in the back, and I'll just be on my phone, you know, watching some Netflix or something. But we wanted to get in shotgun. Number five, Saturday morning cartoons were a big deal. We used to wake up early every Saturday morning to watch the new episodes of cartoons that were coming out. Nowadays, my daughter's like, Netflix, oh, look, Dad, there's a new True. I'm like, you don't, even, you don't even know what we went through to have to wait for like a week to get to the new cartoons, right? They have it instant now. Everything is an instant society that we're living in. Number six, you didn't just wear shoes, you pumped them up. Does anybody remember having these pumps, man? You pushed the basketball on the top, and they made the shoe tighter on your foot. And then when you were done, you pushed the thing, and it would go, and it would let the air out, and you could take the shoe off. You know, you might not remember these. These are the coolest shoes ever. I remember I had a pair, and I thought it was, I was it, because I had these pump-up shoes. They were cool. Not, maybe not so much nowadays. Number seven, high definitions meant adjusting the rabbit ears on top of your television. I remember y'all remember doing that. You'd have to hold it. And then if you really wanted to watch something, you couldn't quite get it clear enough. You just kind of like, and then your parents would make you hold it there so you could finish watching it. I don't know if y'all ever had to do that. Yeah. Number, (laughs) no, y'all understand. Number eight, vending machines were for drinks like Pepsi and Coke. Nowadays, they are forgetting movies and sometimes even acne products and all sorts of things come in vending machines nowadays. Back in the day, we got, we got uh, Pepsi and Coke out of it. You know, when, when I was growing up, and these vending machines, they have, they have this red box now where you can you know, get your movies from. And uh, when I was growing up, we had Blockbuster. Anybody remember Blockbuster? Yeah, right? And it's funny because anytime I, I preach this message at different churches because I feel like it's so prominent for our youth today. And it's funny because everybody can finish this statement if you're from my era, right? And it, or older. You can finish this statement. It says, when you, when you went back to Blockbuster, it was on the side of every tape, and it said, it said, be kind and please rewind. Man, you had to rewind. You got charged extra if you didn't rewind the video. I don't know, right? Number nine, page your cell phones and card IDs were signs that you were technologically advanced. I remember my dad worked on the railroad. He had a pager, and I thought it was the coolest thing in the world that he had a pager that would buzz when his work called him. So, you know, it buzz, and it was, it was really cool. And, uh, you know, at home, you used to have the, we used to have the rotary phones, you know, and, then it would, and if you messed up, you had to start all the way over. Y'all remember that? Yeah, and then when they would call, there was no caller ID. So when you, you took a chance, anytime you answered that phone, it was like, I don't know if I really want to speak to this person who's calling me. So you had to take a chance every time you answered the phone uh, to see if that was somebody that you wanted to talk to or not. And finally, when you wanted to listen to more music, you didn't go to iTunes. You had to flip the cassette tape over and put it in the other side. Look, it would be like halfway through a song, and you'd be jamming and singing, and then like, and then you're like, uh, and then you have to turn around, put it back in, and then you got to finish listening to your song, right? Then if it would ever come out, you had to take like the pencil and like, y'all remember doing that? I, I did. Then sometimes you're like, nope, not worth it, and you just threw the cassette tape away. So this morning, I want to talk to all the teenagers in the room And not just people who are currently teenagers, but ones that are teenagers at heart. If you've ever been a teenager, this is for you. We can all remember back to the times when we were teenagers. And if we're honest, we're all teenagers at heart still. Maybe not on the outside, but at heart. So I want you to think back for a moment. Hit the pause button on life. Hit rewind. Go back to when you were 15, 16, or 17. I want you to think about the clothes you had on, think about the hairstyle you had, the music that was playing in your room, maybe remember your first car. Then I want you to remember how polite and respectful and considerate and well-behaved you were as a teenager. Yeah, some of you, some of you maybe not so much. I know most teenagers haven't quite got their Yet, I have a seven-year-old, and we're working on a lot of those things with her. 
There's a quote I want to share with you, and it says, I see no hope for the future of our people if they are dependent on the frivolous youth of today. For certainly all youth are reckless beyond words. When I was a boy, we were taught to be discreet and respectful of elders, but the present youth are exceedingly wild and impatient. This was a quote from 700 BC by an ancient Greek poet. So as you can see, even back from 700 BC, they thought that their teenagers were going to be the end all of society and and it was just going to be the end all of everything because of the way that teenagers were. You see, some things don't change much and some things that are true will always be true. If you reflect the times that you were a teenager, you can remember the the 50s through the doo-wop era. I think that slide's on there. You might pass it already. 60s was the hippie movement. 70s, you had disco fever. 80s, we had the big hair metal bands. 90s, we had big parachute pants. You know, MC Hammer, we all used to do the dance. I don't know if y'all ever did that. We did, and that was when I grew up, though. And I want to speak to every person in the room in years and those that are young at heart. I just want you to remember like and what, what it was like and what you faced when you were a teenager. See, there's a story in Acts that we can all relate with, and we can all find ourselves going back to the teenager inside all of us. So here's a little background of Acts chapter 20. See, Paul's a great speaker, and he's got some place to be. He's trying to fit in all these sermons, and everybody's loving it. There's a teenager that walks into the room. He sits in the back, and the Bible says Paul was preaching all night in a small confined space on the third floor of a building. So we're going to pick up on Acts chapter 20, verse 7. On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul began talking to them, intending to leave the next day. And he prolonged his message until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room where we gathered together, and there was a young man named Eutychus sitting on the windowsill, sinking into a deep sleep. And as Paul kept on talking, he was overcome by sleep and fell down from the third floor and was picked up dead. But Paul went down and fell upon him. And after embracing him, he said, do not be troubled for life is in him. When he had gone back up and had broken bread and eaten, he talked with them a long while until daybreak and then left. They took away the boy alive and were greatly comforted. Things that are true now and will be true later. Let's bow our heads. Father God, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, God, that we have an opportunity to to meet here together, Father, as a congregation, God. We thank you, God, that we have an opportunity, Lord, to come together and worship you freely, God, without having to face any kind of persecution, God. Lord, I pray, Father God, for um, myself, God, that I can deliver this word, Lord, the way you would have me to do. Lord, let it be your words and not mine, Father God. Lord, I pray, Lord, that uh, everybody who hears my voice, Father God, their ears and hearts and spirits will be open to receive what you have today. Lord, we need you, Father. This is all for nothing, God, if you're not in it, Lord. So please come visit with us today. In Jesus' name, amen. So things that are true now and will be true later. The first one is teenagers are sitting in a dangerous place. Teenagers are sitting in a dangerous place. Verse 9 said, And there was a young man named Eutychus sitting on the windowsill, sinking into a deep sleep. And as Paul kept on talking, he was overcome by sleep and fell down from the third floor and was picked up dead. So we find here that Eutychus, he comes, he walks into this church service. Seeing a packed house, he finds a way, he finds a seat all the way in the back, and it's on the third floor of a, of a building, and he sits on a windowsill. See, it's a picture, I believe, of what's going on in the world today as the enemy is doing his best, luring and drifting our young people to the edge. He does this through movies, cell phones, entertainment, sexuality, pornography. The enemy is rocking our babies to sleep. You see, the enemy doesn't care that our young people come to church as long as they stay disconnected from what's going on. They can be in church all they want, but as long as they don't really grasp who this Jesus is and and experience Jesus in a life-changing way, he doesn't care that they're here. He just wants to keep them on the edge. See, Eutychus, his name ironically means lucky. I know it doesn't sound too lucky that he fell out from a third floor window, but he was lucky that Paul was there. His name means lucky, and he made a bad decision to sit in a dangerous place. When he was sitting there, he fell asleep. You know, we don't know why he was tired. Maybe he had a long day of 
doing his homework and maybe he worked a job and he was doing his chores all day and he had just got tired. I'm sure he didn't stay up late playing video games or on his cell phone or watching his favorite, t- binge watching his favorite TV show. I'm sure he didn't do anything like that like teenagers nowadays do. We don't know why he chose the window. Maybe he was running late. Maybe it was truly just so crowded that was the only place that he had to sit down. Maybe like some teenagers, they sat in the back so they could get away with talking or, or being on their phone. See, I feel like he chose that place because it's the only place that he could find. And he came in, he looked around, and he said, you know what, I'm just going to sit here even though it's a dangerous place. So we give this boy a hard time. We think, man, that's just not very smart. Why would you sit there? But I bet you if we remember back to the time that we were a teenager and what we did when we were 16, maybe we were a little rebellious. Maybe like most teenagers, we have this Superman complex that nothing bad is going to happen to me. I think he's just being a teenager. He goes and he finds a spot to sit down. This is where I'm going to sit. It's on the edge, but you know what? It's not, nothing's bad is going to happen. See, I feel like our young people today, this generation today, is sitting in this dangerous place. We have TV shows, movies, music, all proclaiming a louder message of hopelessness, emptiness. We have pornography on phones and tablets. There's newer drugs. There are more sexual identities than ever before. You say, yeah, that doesn't happen in the place that we live. No, I teach middle school. I promise you all these things are true. I see them daily. Suicide and self-harm is a way to relieve pain. We have young people today that say, you know what? My life is so bad. I'm so numb to anything around me that I cut myself just so I can bleed to know that I'm alive. Just so I can feel, if I feel pain, at least I'm feeling something. That's real. I mean, that's what these young people are going through. I see it daily. It's becoming the norm for families to have no father in the household anymore. See, the enemy is leading our young people to the edge. In fact, John 10, 10 says the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. That's the enemy's mission statement. Steal, kill, destroy. He wants to kill anything being birthed in our young people. He wants to steal the things and the dreams that God is giving them. He wants to tear down all the things that, are, that God is trying to build up in their life. He wants to see parents separate and teenagers splitting time between mom and dad. He wants to see them bound by addiction and then lie and say everything's okay, nothing's wrong. He wants to see them torn between whether they feel like a guy or whether they feel like a girl. This is what our teenagers are going through nowadays. This is what our teenagers and our young people are experiencing. And even if they're not going through it, they have friends who are going through it. See, the enemy is luring our young people to the edge. His goal is to see every, per, every young person to fall to church to their spiritual death. But see, I believe that there is a God who sees what's going on, and he, need, and he is using the church to embrace these young people. We are the church that should be embracing these young people. See, the enemy had three points, and that's to kill, steal, and destroy. But I'm glad John 10.10 doesn't end there. Because then it says at the end of that, I come, or I came, that they may have life and have it more abundantly. He wants to see people, he wants to see our young people so passionate and on fire for him, not just to have life, but to have abundant life, to enjoy life. See, some people in here today, you may have a son, a daughter, a grandson, a granddaughter, and they're far away from God and they fall into this Eutychus spirit. And maybe they used to sit on these pews with you or at another church, and they were all about their salvation, all about the relationship with Jesus Christ at that time in their life. But as they've got older, they've taken different, made different decisions and taken, taken different roads that have led them away from Jesus. They don't want to do any, they don't want to have anything to do with God. You wish nothing more than that your 
grandson, granddaughter, son, daughter, brother, sister, whoever it is in your life who's that prodigal was sitting here with you today. I'm here to tell you today, and it's one of the things that I really felt like God has put on my spirit, is don't grow weary in well-doing. Don't grow weary in praying for that young person or for that prodigal son and daughter, that prodigal grandson, granddaughter, that prodigal father, mother, whatever, whoever it is that you're praying for, that you're praying that God grips them, that God gets a hold of them, that God just radically changes their life. Don't grow weary in well-doing that you say, all right, God, I've prayed and I've prayed and I've prayed, but I'm not seeing the change, and you stop praying. Things that you sow now, the seed that you sow now will be reaped later on. That's the laws of the harvest. I can't sow a seed right now and expect a plant just to pop up, right? We sow seed, and in time, those seeds will grow. The prayers you are praying now are the seeds that you are sowing to see that young person or that prodigal person come back to Jesus Christ. So I'm here to tell you today, if you are praying for somebody to know Jesus, if you're praying for a loved one to come back home, continue to pray for that loved one. Call them out in prayer daily. The enemy wants our loved ones. The enemy wants our young people. On the side of Shearwood Baptist Church is carved this, and it's one of my favorite quotes because I believe it's so important. It says, he who wants this generation more will have him. He who wants this generation more will have them. How bad do we want this generation to know Jesus Christ? How bad do we want this generation to experience the same love and forgiveness and transformation that we've experienced? If we don't make winning this generation a priority, the devil will, and he will have them. It's true now and it's true later that teenagers are sitting in a dangerous place. Number two, teenagers are not the church of tomorrow. They are the church of right now. If you're a young person in this room, it is not a sit back and wait your turn. I know, I know Pastor Atkins, he's a good friend of mine, and I know that any young person that comes up to him and says, Pastor Atkins, I want to serve. I don't care where. I'll clean bathrooms. I'll be an usher. I'll greet people. I'll work in the nursery. I'll work in kids' ministry. I'll sweep the floors. I don't care. Just let me serve. I promise you he'll find a place for you to serve. Okay, Young people, you cannot sit back. You need to be involved. Find something in the church and do it. Older generation, Satan has a place for these young people outside this church if we do not find a place for them inside the church for them to fit and belong. God does not want this generation to go to waste. We have to make it a priority. This generation is ready to be used by God. They have a story to tell, a testimony to share, and a gift to use. We have a young, a young person who, when Laura and I go uh, travel places to preach, she'll come with us and travel and share her testimony. This is a, seven, a 16, 17-year-old girl who, if you heard her testimony, would blow your mind about what God's done in her life. 16 years old. And she can reach other people who I couldn't. Because she knows what it's like to go through certain things that I don't. They have, our young people have a story to tell and a testimony to share. We have got to let them do that. And they have a gift to use. See, the Bible is full of stories of young people being raised up. There are seven-year-old kings being raised up. Fourteen-year-old boys slaying giants. You are not too young to be used by God. A couple years ago, I think it was two camping seasons ago, um, I had the honor of being able to preach at Camp Loman for the week for our, our teen uh, camp. And on the last night, uh, we had about 24, 25 young people come up and say, God called me into and said what God called them into, whether it was music ministry, kids ministry, uh, being a youth pastor, preaching and evangelism, uh, missions. It, they, they all were called into something. 
like 23 or 24. And I was just like, wow, God, that is incredible. We have all these young people who are saying that God has called me into this, whatever it is. And I think, and I look back and I think, man, we really dropped the ball. (laughs) Myself included, really dropped the ball. Like, what are you, what are you saying? Well, this is how I, this is how we, I told you, I'm being very real with you. I believe in being real and transparent. Um, I'll tell you when I mess up, and Lord knows I, I mess up more than I should. <clears throat> we had 24 young people come up and say they were called into something, and I think to myself, how many of those 24 were discipled in what they were called in to do? You go back home, you go back to your churches, you go back into everyday life, and then here's what happens. Satan starts to whisper, you know that that didn't, you weren't really called into that, right? You, that was just an emotion that you felt at that time. It's not real. You really weren't called into preaching or kids ministry or whatever. Just, just wait. Don't do anything right now. And then as they wait, they begin to grow away and they begin to, that passion isn't, that fire isn't kept going, and so it fizzles out and it dies. And, the, and this young person who felt like they were called is now doing God knows what because we didn't, we didn't feed, we didn't disciple, we didn't help them grow. God help us. The young people in this church have a calling. They have a purpose. They have a testimony. They have talents. They have skills. As a church, we have got to disciple the young people that God has given us. Amen? See, I thank God for the ones who spoke into my life when I was a teenager. They, I, I had received my calling, and I had people like Jason Vernon and David Brown who, who took time to be intentional with me, who took time to say, I know there's a calling. I can see there's a calling. I can see these giftings. People like Ron, who was our state youth director and camp director at the time, who put on these incredible camps that will always, I mean, most of my best experiences with God were at Camp Loman. And I'm appreciative for people like Ron, who had a heart for camping ministry and said, I believe in camping ministry and what it does and, and, and they brought us here and they had incredible worship and the stage decked out and all these things. And it was like, man, this was awesome. I never wanted to leave. Right. But it's people who sacrifice like that. People who gave people who purposely was intentional with me. Who are you being intentional with? Who are you pouring? What young person are you pouring into to see them grow, to see them change, to see them step into their calling? I want you to look what Paul does here in verse 10. He says, but Paul went down and fell upon him. So he watched, Paul watches this boy fall out the window. The Bible doesn't talk about what Paul was preaching that day. It doesn't talk about his sermon. What it says is what's important. That was this, that he sees this person fall out the window to their death, stops what he's doing, runs down three flights of steps, and falls upon him, Right? This is my thoughts on this. This is not found in the Bible. But I know in modern day, sometimes we see that. And Paul, I mean, you got to think, these people are here, to, they're there to hear Paul preach, right? And so this boy fell out the window, and Paul has to stop his preaching. Sometimes, I, I don't know, in my mind, I think, man, that, I'm sitting here, I'm trying to listen to you preach, Paul. Why are you stopping preaching to help some kid who was dumb enough to sit on the window still? Right? Like, I feel like that would be a thought that people would have. I know it would be a thought that I may have. I'm being real and honest with you. Like, they're, they sat over there and they fell out. Why are we stopping what we're doing? I'm here to receive. Right? And sometimes we lose sight of that. We lose sight of, it's not always about me. So he runs down three flights of steps. He falls on that, that young man, this teenager. What love, man, to stop everything he's doing, following this young boy. Didn't know this boy. I'm sure the people in the congregation knew him. And I don't know much about Eutychus, but what if Eutychus was a troublemaker? (laughs) 
What if Eutychus was always on his phone or always distracting? What if Eutychus talked all the time or, I don't know, did things that we may find annoying? <laughs> Would we stop what we were doing to run down three flights of step and fall on Eutychus? Or we just keep on going because, you know what, that's just one young person. You see, I, felt like, I feel like Paul saw more in Eutychus than Eutychus saw in himself. God sees more in our teenagers in this generation than they see in themselves. He doesn't look at a generation of nobodies. He doesn't look at a group of kids without a future. He doesn't see a generation that's spiritually dead. In fact, 1 Peter 2, 9 says, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into marvelous light. This is a generation that are participators, not spectators. Teenagers are the church of right now. If you can come. Point three here, teenagers must be embraced. Verse 10, the second part of that says, but Paul went down and fell upon him. And after embracing him, he said, do not be troubled for life is in him. You want to see a dead generation come to life? Find a teenager and embrace him. Find a young person and go up to him and say, I love you. Jesus loves you. You matter. You, you have worth. God has a plan for you. It goes a long ways. Teenagers might not look the same as they used to. They might not use the same words as we used to use. But I promise you this, they are hurting. And a lot of times they're very helpless. If we don't embrace these young people, somebody else will. And a lot of times those are the, the people of the world. Things of the world will embrace them. If I tell you what I was like at 16, it wasn't pretty. You can ask some of the people here. They could probably tell you the same. I made a lot of bad choices, a lot of mistakes. And I'm so thankful for God's grace and God's mercy. But a lot of our teenagers are in the same place. They're a mess, just like I was at 16, trying to figure out what I'm doing in life. Sitting on the windowsill in this dangerous place. You cannot impact what you are not willing to embrace. You cannot impact what you are not willing to embrace. If we are not willing to embrace these young people, these teenagers who will come into this church, who may look different, who may have pants sagging, who may say a cuss word every once in a while, <laughs> I'm being real, it happens all the time uh, in camps and everything else. And you have to say, all right, hey, look, we don't do that here. I'm still going to love you anyways, but that's not something we do here, you know. If we're not willing to embrace these unchurched, not knowing God, young people. If we're not willing to put our arms around them and say, I love you. You matter. You have worth. If we're not willing to do that, the culture will. In fact, I would say at certain times, the culture has embraced these young people tighter than the church has. We have to be a church that embraces everybody, young people who don't know Jesus, older people who don't know Jesus. Paul went down to Eutychus. He didn't wait for somebody else. He didn't try to find Eutychus's parents and say, hey, you guys, go take care of that. He identified with this dead teenager. I don't know if you know Paul's story, but it's a pretty miraculous one. So I, I just believe that he, his heart broke for this young boy. And you remember what he was like when he was a teenager before he maybe knew Jesus. And he runs down those steps and he puts his arms around them. He says, don't be troubled for life is in him. You see, when everybody else had gave up on Eutychus, He's laying there dead. Paul goes down and he sees life. He embraces him. 
Church, we cannot give up on our teenagers. We have got to make this generation a priority, winning this generation a priority. I saw a picture recently on Facebook and it said, the writing, it had a guy pointing the picture and it said, be who you needed when you were younger. Be who you needed when you were younger. If you think back to when you were a kid, I was very fortunate to have some people who were very, very intentional with me and very intentional with making sure that I I stayed the best I could on a straight and narrow. Not everybody had that. Be who you needed. If you didn't have that, find a young person and be that to that young person, right? And if you did, find a young person and be that to that young person. Who, Whatever you needed when you were younger, whatever you experienced, you have the opportunity to share and to help a young person because you have no clue what some of the young people that we have come in our building go through. I'm gonna be real, real, very real with you at the moment. You know what? If you were molested as a child, there's young people that are still being molested as a child that you can identify with and show them what Jesus can do when he gets a hold of your life and how he can help you through that situation. You had an alcoholic father or mother, you were beat, guess what? Still happens today. Be what you needed back then to a young person today. Guys, we're all hurting. I I know Laura laughs at me because I say it everywhere we go, but (laughs) it's okay to not be okay, right? It's okay to, to be real and say, I'm struggling. It's okay to say, I'm facing this. It's okay to say, man, this is a tough season for me. In fact, the Bible says in James that we're supposed to tell people that's what we're going through so they can pray with us so we can be healed and help through those times, right? Sometimes I think we get into this, not everywhere, but places we get into this place where we can't feel like we can talk about what's going on because other people are gonna think that we're different or that they don't, we don't identify. If you have a problem, man, share it with somebody who's trusted so you guys can pray together, be accountable to each other. This altar call, I'm gonna have it as three parts because I think all three are important. If you don't mind, everybody can stand. The first part of this altar call is, I never wanna go anywhere and preach anywhere where I do not give an opportunity for people to know Jesus Christ. So if you are in this place today and you've never accepted Christ as your savior, or maybe you have and you've fallen away, maybe you once knew Jesus Christ, but you, you have, you've gone away from that and you're not where you should be, I wanna open the altars up to have an opportunity for you to make that right. So if that's anybody in this place, I'm not one that says, all right, everybody bow your heads. I'm one that says, you know what? Jesus took a cross for you in front of everybody and Jesus hung on a cross for you in front of everybody. Nobody needs to bow their head for you to accept the savior who did that for you. That's just my opinion on that. So (laughs) some people do it different. Some people do it different. But if you need Jesus, the altars are open. I don't care who's here looking at you. If you need Jesus, that's between you and Jesus. Come up here and and meet with your Savior today. The second part of this altar call, second part of this altar call is I want anybody that's here that's under the age of, let's say, 22 to come up front. If you are under the age of 22, I just want you to come up front in this altar area. Anybody 22 and younger? I'm not going to embarrass you. I promise. You can come right here. You can stand right here. Yep. Church, we have young people that are here in this church that I promise you will go through more than we ever could think, even in the fact of school, what they deal with on a daily basis in school what they hear in school, at work. There is so many things that are attacking our young people today. So what I want us to do as a congregation, as a church body, is I want us to cover these young people in prayer. So this is what I I want to do. I know it's a little bit different, but anybody who's out there and who's willing, young people, if you could just turn and face me, just look at me. Anybody who's out there and who's willing, I just want you to come up here. I just want you to lay their hand on their shoulder and I just want you to pray over them. 
If you're willing to come up here and just pray over these young people, I want you to do that. And I just want you to pray for protection. I want you to pray that God helps them through everything that they are going to experience through their daily walk as a young person. Lord, Father God, I thank you for the young people that are in this church, God. Lord God, I pray, Lord Father God, that Lord, that you just ignite a passion and a fire inside of them, Father, to know you more, God, to seek you more, Lord, to, to search for you more, Father God, because when they do that, they will find you, God, and, and you will radically change their life, God. Lord, I pray for protection around them. Lord, when they go out into this world, protect them, God. Protect their minds, Father. Lord, I pray, God, that they know, Lord, that no matter what, God, they matter, God. They have worth, Lord. Lord, that you love them so much, God, that you died on a cross for them, Lord. God, I pray, Lord, that they can be so radically in love with you, Father, that, that it just changes everybody else that they come around, God. Lord, when they go out, I pray, God, that everywhere they go, that you give them that territory in your name, God. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you uh, help them, Father God, through their struggles, God. Lord, we all have these struggles, God, in our life, God. I pray, Lord, that you help them through those times, Lord. Lord, when they when they are low, God, I pray that you just begin to give them a hug and say, I love you, and they can feel your presence, God. Lord, and when they're on their high, God, let, let them turn to you and just say, God, you are faithful and you are good, Lord. Lord, protect them, Lord. Use them, Father God. Lord, put people in their life to be intentional, to see their growth, God. And God, we just give them to you, Lord, Father God. Lord, have your hand upon them, Lord. Lord, let them win their friends, Lord, for you, God. Let them be an example of, of who you are to the other people around them, God. Touch them, Father God. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Jesus name. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. The th the last part of this altar call that I want us to do and and I feel like this is important because I feel like this is going to impact a lot of people in this room. If you would be honest, just by a raise of hands, if you have anybody in your life that you've been praying for, that doesn't know Jesus, maybe they never have, maybe they used to and they've fallen away, and they are a prodigal son, daughter, grandson, granddaughter, mom, dad, aunt, uncle, cousin, friend, I don't care. If they are a prodigal and they need to know Jesus and you've been praying and praying and praying for them, would you slip up your hand? There's hands up all over this church. So here's what I want you to do right now. And I guess I believe I, the Bible is very clear. And actually, I'm going to read it to you. In Matthew 18, 18 through 20, it says, Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I tell you truly that if two of you on the earth agree about anything you ask for it, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three gather together in my name, there am I with them. I believe that when we corporately grab hands with somebody or put our hand on somebody and we believe together and we pray together for somebody that the heavens are just shaken up, I believe it. I believe that God is going to move. So what I want you to do is that person, whoever, you find somebody else who, who is praying for somebody and I want you to share with them that person's name. I want you to call out that person's name to that other person because that person's gonna pray for you and you're gonna pray for that other person about whoever this prodigal son or daughter is. And I believe that when we bind together and we pray believing and we pray trusting God, that one, our faith is going to be lifted up and two, that God is going to move upon their life, amen? So find somebody in here. If you have your hand up, you can keep it up. Find somebody in here, tell them that name you're praying for and let's pray together over those people. Lord, Father God, I pray, Lord, for these prodigal sons, daughters, Father God, any prodigal uh, people, Father, that are in our lives, Father God, that you just begin, Lord, to, to make, to change their life, Father God. 
Lord, I pray, God, that you begin to just change that where that person is right now, God. Lord, that you begin to just change their, their heart, change their thinking, change their mind. Lord, I pray that you make them so uncomfortable where they're at right now, God, that they can't help but to come to you, Father God. Lord God, I pray, Lord, that you just let your conviction and your Holy Spirit work in their life and you draw them back to you, God. Lord, I pray for the ones who are, are praying for these prodigals, God. Lord, I pray, Lord, that when they have doubts in their mind, Father God, and they say, Lord, I don't know if I can continue to do so. I'm not seeing any changes. Things are only getting worse, God, that they can push through, God. They can continue to pray and they can continue to believe. Lord, Father God, we call out these names to you, Father, believing in what your word says, Father God, in Matthew, that if we ask anything in your name, Father, if the Lord is glorified, that it will be done and given to us, God. So I pray for these people, Father God. Bring them back into fellowship with you, Lord. Bring them back. Lord, to your love and to your grace and to your mercy, God. Lord, you can still use them, Father. Some of them, Father, may have had a calling on their life at one time, God. You can still use them in that calling, Father. Lord, we trust and we believe in you, Father, for these prodigals to come home, God. Lord, there's only by your power your resurrection power. Father God, that these prodigals will come home, Lord. There's nothing that we will do, Lord, but by your power, bring these prodigals home, Lord. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, we believe, God. We believe, God. We believe, Father God. We believe, God. We worship you, Father. We worship you, God. Church, I'm about to turn it over, back over to, to Pastor Robbie. But I want to encourage you one last time. Love this, love these young people. When God brings young people into this church, love on them. Even if they're different, love on them. Tell them that they're important. Tell them that they matter. They need that. They need that. God is good. Amen. Amen. Pastor Robbie.